baptize you, this Gentile, into the body of Christ. Let us pray. God, speak to your speak your solemn message of hope to us once more. As we have gathered on this Resurrection Sunday to celebrate Easter, we celebrate the good news that is in our lives. We celebrate the reasons that have brought family, neighbors, friends together under this roof. So speak to us your message of hope as people of faith so that as we prayed in wisdom that we might not only be hearers of the word but doers of the word not only today but all the days that you have granted us in our living let William Williams III sit down and let your Holy Spirit please Lord stand in my place speak to me speak through me and because I am a sinner in need of your saving grace speak in spite of me in Jesus name I pray amen Earlier this week, an old couple received a phone call from their son who lives far away. The son said he was sorry, but he couldn't, he wouldn't be able to come for a visit this holiday season after all. The grandkids say hello, he said, and they assured him, these, this couple, that they understood. But when they hung up the phone, they didn't dare look at each other. Earlier this week, a woman was called into her supervisor's office to hear that times are hard for the company and they had to let her go. So sorry. She cleaned out her desk, packed away her hopes for getting ahead and wondered what she would tell her kids. Earlier this week, someone received terrible news from a physician. Someone else heard the words, I don't love you anymore. Earlier this week, someone's hope was crucified and the darkness became overwhelming. My brothers and sisters here today, no one is ever ready to encounter Easter, to celebrate Easter, until he or she has spent time in the dark place where hope cannot be seen. And in fact, Easter is the last thing we are expecting, and that is why it terrifies us. This day is less about bunnies or springtime and new outfits, and, but for followers of Jesus, this day is about more hope than we can handle. It's about experiencing a transformative resurrection. As we heard in the scripture readings today by Lena, this day is about experiencing a transforming hope, a transformative resurrection that we're often not ready for. And the challenge we face is to look beyond the resurrection event as an isolated culmination in God's saving activity in the world as a moment in history, but instead experience the hope, the resurrection, the hope that the resurrection offers us not only inwardly, but also experience the hope that the resurrection offers us in practical ways. My prayer, my hope that as you leave this place of celebrating Easter, I hope that you leave in ways that put tangible actions behind the visions and the plans, the songs, the word, the message, the greetings that we have experienced today as people of faith. I hope that you don't let this day go by at a moment of gathering and go out into these, this world the same. I hope in a small but tangible way you are transformed. It may not be a spectacular transformation, but I hope that you sing a song, that you have a message, that you see a friend, that you see something in somebody's eyes that will allow you to leave these walls and put into action your faith. On this, on the first Easter, you heard the many stories throughout the ages and the years of people who were transformed. But before the transformation, 
there might be a proverb that sums up how they felt. A proverb that comes from the 29th chapter of the book, verse 18, which reads, where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. And though Jesus' followers may not have been physically dead after his crucifixion, emotionally and spiritually they were walking cadavers. They had no vision. On the morning we know as, that we've come to know as Easter or the Resurrection Mori, Mary and others go to Jesus' tomb not in anticipation of his resurrection, but in fact to complete his burial. Even on that Easter afternoon, you might uh, f be familiar with the various scriptures uh, known as the walk to Emmaus. Two followers of Jesus are speaking about their dashed hopes, their lack of vision. And you hear them saying in those scriptures, we had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. And if you go back to that scripture, you'll notice it says had hope, the past tense. Notice the past tense. They had hope. Hope unrequited is a cruel emotion. They had hope, but hope no more. For their hope died when Jesus died. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I know I can relate to the many times that I had hope, but I hoped no more. I can recount the number of stories throughout my life, whether it was childhood or teenage years or college years or as a young adult living far away from home. I can recount early years of my marriage, early times of parenthood, even my times as a pastor where there are times that I had hope, but I hope no more. And maybe you too can relate to me. Maybe you too can place yourselves in the many stories of that first Easter. Moments when you had hope but hope no more. And we find uh, the same sort of situation happening in, uh, in, happening in Isaiah, the first scripture, or the second scripture that Lena read. Isaiah prophesies to a people who had lost hope, who had forgotten joy. And even the Acts scripture today that I read gives us insight to an undergirding of hopelessness present because of societal norms. In both of these scriptures, even in the first scripture read, the resurrection story, there is no vision, there is no hope. But what you should be reminded to hear, but what you should be reminded of as you hear the uh, constantly throughout scriptures is that God's vision for God's people is not a lifetime bookmarked with grief and hopelessness, but God's vision, God's vision is not for people to live in fear and despair. But through the prophets, through the judges, through regular people, through scripture, through even Jesus Christ, through Peter and Paul, through even in, through all the way through the book of Revelation, time and time again, we hear a vision that says we, uh, we hear scriptures and words of hope that encourage us to have a vision that sees a joy-filled world. And I wanted us to experience that joy because in the midst of this, these times, in the midst of the celebration, in the midst of the sorrow, in the midst of the grief. We don't always come expecting Easter. We're not always prepared to experience the joy of Easter. But in some way, shape, or form, whether we have our ups or we have our downs, if we can experience and live a world, a joy-filled world where we're singing, whether it's tears falling from our face or with a big smile, joy to the world. The Lord has not only come, but the Lord has risen. The Lord has taught. The Lord has saved. The Lord is alive. Imagine a joy-filled world. Yes, because Jesus is risen. But maybe more importantly, because you have been transformed by the resurrected Jesus. You can see a vision in the world where, as Lena again read earlier, the carnivorous lion has become a vegan. 
and the lamb finds trust and ease and peace. You can see practical ways that a healthy living, healthy decision making, and healthy systems of education, restorative justice, infant mortality awareness, and more than just adequate health insurance can bring to reality those visions of hope in a beloved community where as we read in Isaiah 65 uh, chapter that infants will no longer live a few days, old persons at a hundred will be considered young, and people without homes will uh, will live in homes that they build and wages will be fair. Imagine a joy-filled world because you have experienced a transformative resurrection that moves you like Peter to live in ways that break down societal norms where Gentiles and Jews can come together, where imagine a world where we are worshiping on Easter Sunday and we have an Indian fellowship congregation who is celebrating right here on campus. Imagine a world where societal norms have been broken down where an African-American pastor can stand in this pulpit on a Resurrection Sunday and preach to a diverse congregation that Jesus Christ has risen indeed. Imagine a world where we can sing on Easter Sunday that great Christmas song, Joy to the World. Imagine a world. My brothers and sisters, it's important to note that the transforming act in, in acts in, in, in all these moments is an important one for the movement of the church. But I have to be honest, it's a humbling experience to stand in this pulpit Sunday after Sunday and ask my wife, sometimes I lie awake at night and I'm up early thinking about what the Lord is going to say. When I think about uh, all the, the, the young children the, and, and, and the minds and, and the youth uh, and, and all the young children that are sitting here, when I cast my gaze across this congregation and consider the uh, enormous amount of wisdom and knowledge and experience and expertise contained in this membership, I find myself saying at night, is there, what does the Lord want us to hear? But I also lay awake at night with with joy, with hope, saying, is there anything, is there any world problem that this congregation could not solve if we put our minds to it? Look around. Look at all that we have to offer as a joy-filled people. Yet sometimes we dare not to just sit here. In the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., there is a plaque that says, thou shall not be a victim. Thou shall not be a perpetrator. Above all, thou shall not be a bystander. Abraham Lincoln said to sin by silence when they should have protest makes cowards of men. Martin Luther King Jr. said our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. I know I said earlier about filling out your yellow uh, visitors cards and, and to stay connected, but there's something serious that I mean about when we look around, when we look at the enormity of who we are as people of Christ, as followers of Jesus, regardless of our theological stance, regardless of where we are and how we understand the resurrection, the Trinity, and all the things that may divide us, regardless of where we are, when we look around as people of faith, it's important for us to stay connected as a movement so that we can be the hands, the feet, and the love of Jesus in this world. And so we don't ask you to fill out cards so that we can send you more emails, but we ask that you fill out cards so that you can be connected to a powerful movement that's happening within and outside of these walls of FUMC Westfield. We desire to be, as Peter said in Acts chapter 10, more like a Jesus who goes around doing good and healing people of all their inflictions and infirmities, who anointed with the Holy Spirit. We are a fellowship 
We're a fellowship of people who had the boldness and the audacity to say that a, a fledgling uh, organization can have space on the third floor. And when they presented a mission to us to say, we want to be a place that offers healing and hope to kids and families who have uh, experienced the painful sorrow of death and to help them find tangible ways that the resurrection is real in their lives. This church said, amen, let our doors be open. And that organization, Imagine, has grown and continues to touch countless lives of boys, girls, men, women, and children throughout not only our region, but the world. This is a fellowship of faith that had the audacity to open our doors, our facility, and our space to strangers, and not only just to walk around, but strangers to sleep and to stay a place that they call home for just a week or two weeks at a time. We're a fellowship that's bold enough to knit shawls and hats of comfort and hope to those who are not only born in this world, but those who are transitioning into the next and for everyone in between. We are a type of fellowship that's bold enough to have our facility not only be a place of beauty and tradition, but we have the audacity to go a step further and make this a place where we are doing our part to take care of the food insecurity right here in West Westfield and the growing of vegetables. But we didn't stop there. We even had the further boldness to say that we want to transform our 12 gardens our front yard signage and even the bell tower as a place of invitation for all people in the community to come so that they can understand that this place is a place of God's welcoming love. And if you ever want a visit in the bell tower, go see our man Jack Panos over there and he'll be glad to take you up those steps and let you ring that bell. We are a place that welcomes and invites all of God's people. We're even a place that has a crazy pastor who in the middle of September will sit on our uh, front yard and be dunked in cold water. <laughs> I say all this, my brothers and sisters, because we are a place that's trying to live out the transformative resurrection of Jesus Christ. It wasn't a one-time moment for us. It wasn't a historical event that, uh, event that we can watch uh, CNN or Discovery Channel or pick up a Time magazine and talk about the historical event of the resurrection. But the resurrection transforms each and every one of us because we have found ourselves in the dark places. We have found ourselves in the hopeless nights. We have found ourselves yearning and wanting God to speak a message of hope for us. And there have been people around who, like Mary, who, like the first disciples on that resurrection day, helped pick us up. And though we may not have wanted to move forward, helped us move forward, helped us see the light, and helped us become a better version of ourselves. We are not perfect. Far from it. But we continue to live out a transformative resurrection that encourages us to celebrate Easter, that gives us hope to live out, that makes way a pathway for us to realize that anything is possible. Look, Peter's proclamation of the resurrection is not simply about having a world in which people get along and act nice, but it's about becoming someone we cannot yet imagine. By wrapping our heads and our hearts around such a paradigm shift, when you, we become closer to the kingdom of God. I want to end my sermon today by recognizing and remembering uh, uh, some young girls. I had a chance to go to a lemonade stand uh, by some, uh, that was put on by some young girls in our congregation. And they sold me a dollar glass of lemonade. And it was some good lemonade. And they said that, uh, that they are raising money for a cancer foundation that's near to their heart. My brothers and sisters, it doesn't take a building for us, as Peter said, to do good, to go about, but it takes a transformative resurrection that we're able to live each and every day. It takes someone 
who's able to, in the midst of our heartache and pain, see hope in tomorrow. It takes singing that Christmas song, Joy to the World, and combining it with the Easter song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. Because He Lives. Because He Lives. A transformative resurrection. It's about recognizing we're not ready for Easter. It's about recognizing going into this world, expecting the unexpected. But it's about being ready, being ready to meet the hope and joy of the day. Because your hearts, your minds have been transformed by a message of love. I leave you with these words from John Wesley. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, at all times you can, to all people you can, as long as you ever can. Who knows when our days are up on this earth, but as long as you have breath, celebrate Easter, celebrate the resurrection, and continue to be a hope of joy. Imagine in this world. Amen.